Well, hello, folks. Welcome to this weekend's edition of Calvary Baptist Church's Weekend Worship Online. Pastor Brett here, along with our tremendous tech team of Tom and Tanya. Together, we want to welcome you on this holiday weekend, kind of the last big opportunity of the summer to be able to get out. Not sure what your plans are. I hope you've got something fun in mind to be able to enjoy uh, the, the beauty of God's creation, enjoy these uh, nice summer days that we have. You know, as we think about Labor Day, um, I think oftentimes we just sort of skip over that, but it really is a religious holiday. Do you ever think of it in that way? The truth is that Scripture tells us every good thing, including our skills and abilities, are gifts to us from God. And so as we celebrate um, the fact that we have the opportunity to work and to labor, um, really we need to be sure we give thanks to God. God for giving us the skills, God for giving us the abilities, God for giving us the opportunity to use those in ways that not only provide for our families, that not only allow for us to ensure that we've got shelter and food on our table and so forth, um, but also as a way of maximizing, optimizing uh, these vessels he's given us, these bodies. And so my hope is that this Labor Day, whatever you're doing, whether you're out by the beach or you're doing some yard work or whatever it might be, that you pause at some point during the day to thank God, not only for a day off, but thank him for the gifts and skills and abilities that he has given to you. Well, we've gathered uh, this weekend to worship him. We're going to move into that right off. We're going to do so with a song entitled, So Good, which I hope is what your thoughts and feelings are toward God. He is so good. I may this song move you along and, and encourage you in that way as we begin our worship together. Still singing because you are 
All right, so good. Is that how you're feeling right now? So good. You're uh, feeling that way toward worship. Hopefully you're feeling that way toward prayer because that's where we're going to be moving next, spending some time in God's presence. So uh, bow with me if you would as we come before our Lord in a season of prayer this day. Let's pray. Almighty Father, how we thank you for this time and this privilege that we have to come before you. Lord, we don't probably seize it as often as we should, but we know that we have the availability every moment of every day to come into your presence. But to do that not only because there's burdens and sometimes joys that, uh, that are there in our hearts, um, but to do so, Lord, because you like to hear from us, because you want to continue to nurture and um, further that relationship that we have. So, so thank you, God. Thank you for not only being there, uh, but thank you for desiring um, to strengthen that relationship that we have with you. We think this day of uh, just a few of the concerns that are impacting our church family. We think, for example, of Charlene as she continues to recover from her broken hip. Uh, God, she's uh, doing that at home, and so we ask that you would be with her as she continues on in this recovery process. Use the physical, the various therapists that are coming in, occupational and physical, to help strengthen her so that she can regain not only the, um, the strength that's needed, Lord, but the mobility that allows her to live life back in the ways that she had enjoyed prior to the break. So may your hand rest upon her. We pray a similar, Lord, for Bev, who um, is also at home recovering from a fall in which she's broken several ribs and her collarbone. We're grateful for both of these ladies for the improvement and progress that's been made, but they're not 100%. And so in Bev's case, uh, may the passing of each day result in a little bit more strengthening, a little bit more mending of those ribs of that collarbone. May the pain diminish um, uh, gradually to that point, Lord, where uh, she doesn't even notice uh, that those uh, issues are there any longer. Be with John, Lord, as he continues to provide care. We ask that you would watch over him as well. And then we think of a friend of Vicki and of Charlene, Lord, a woman named Janet, who recently fell and um, is just having some complications from that. It really kind of dovetails with some other health issues, diabetes, um, UTI, sepsis that she's wrestling with. And so as her body seeks to bounce back from all of these various affirmities, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with her. May your healing presence rest upon her. May you permeate throughout her entire being, touching her in each and every place that she needs your touch so that she too can be restored to health and resume the quality of life that she knew before all of this. Finally, Lord, we uh, think of those um, on the East Coast who are uh, struggling to recover from uh, the recent hurricane. God, from Adelia, is it as it sort of winds its way out to, to sea now, we know that there's a lot of destruction left in its wake. And, and so for those that are rebuilding homes and lives, we pray for stamina and for strength. Lord, I know at least of a couple of lives that were lost connected to this. And so be a source of comfort to family and friend who are grieving the loss. And for all of those, Lord, who are just um, kind of at a, a point of shock, trying to take it in and figuring out what next steps will be. We ask, Lord, that you would bring uh, around them individuals that can not only be a comforting presence, but maybe can provide for them words of counsel. Um, God can help guide them and in the ways that will help them to um, acquire the resources that are need so that they can rebuild their lives, not only in terms of structures, but in terms of, of just the lives that they had lived prior to all of this. Lord, thank you that we can come before you. Um, with these burdens, some of which we know, some of them impacting people that we'll never meet, and yet we know that they're important to you. Father, watch over them as we pray now that you watch over us as we turn to your word. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear all that you would have us to learn this day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, grab your Bibles, get ready as we turn to God's Word. Always, at least for me, kind of the highlight of the service because I so love seeing what God is going to reveal to us this day. Uh, we are continuing on in our series within a series, the smaller series, being a look at the Ten Commandments or the Big Ten, as we've kind of referred to them, the broader series 
is the book of Exodus, but at least for a few weeks, we have been going week by week through the various commandments that are given to us in the Ten Commandments. Today, we're again on the 20th chapter. We're going to be looking at the seventh verse, and so uh, grab your Bibles as you begin to turn over to that place. Again, just a quick recap. Remember, we're talking here about uh, people uh, that God has pulled together called the Hebrew people, the Israelites. Um, He has set them free from 400 years of slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, They've crossed the Red Sea. They're now in uh, the beginning part of what's going to end up being a 40-year journey toward the Promised Land. And as they sort of begin this journey, they find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai, where God himself is giving to them the Ten Commandments, sort of a synopsis of a broader uh, group of instructions that God is giving them um, through the law. But these Ten Commandments are really kind of a condensing of those uh, moral pieces uh, that go along with that. Um, and as we look at this, we're, we've already gone through two. We've gone through the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Gone through the second commandment, I don't make any idols. And today we're looking at that commandment uh, that tells us not to take the name of the Lord in vain. And of all of the commandments, I think this is certainly one of maybe the one that we violate, violate most frequently. Um, we hear people misusing God's name uh, pretty much all around us. In fact, I am uh, I think I'm convinced that we end up hearing God's name dishonored in today's world more than we hear it honored. Just to, because of the way that it's used on TV, on the radio, uh, the way we hear it used in the streets, in the classroom, in the workplace. Um, so many times uh, we see that God's name is just not exalted in the manner that it's uh, prescribed to be. So, so we're going to spend some time looking at that this day. Uh, again, we're at the 20th chapter, the 7th verse, and let's see what God would say to us through his word. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. As we look at this third commandment that God has has given to us, we're reminded of just the importance and significance of names. Now, I think we're already aware of that, aren't we? All of us um, at least value our own name. Think about it. If there's a list that goes up somewhere, what's the first name that you look for? It's your name. If if different people are crying out different uh, names, what's the name that catches your attention? It's your name. We we know that we uh, enjoy, enjoy hearing what's said about our name, and we hope that it's treated appropriately. Well, the same thing is true for God. He wants us to recognize that, uh, that his name is, is worthy of reverence and respect, in fact, even of awe. And that's, I think, truer uh, if we look at things in, in terms of the Old Testament perspective, because back in the Old Testament days, a name wasn't just a label that somebody received at their birth. It really was a description of who they were. Names meant something. The words literally meant something. And so it described a person's character, their attributes, maybe something about their, their reputation. Um, And it was so significant that if something profound happened in their lives, a person's name might even be changed partway through. We see examples of that in the Old Testament when we see that Abram was was changed to Abraham, of Sarai was changed to Sarah, how uh, Jacob ended up becoming Israel. We think of the New Testament and of how uh, Paul uh, had his name changed from Saul, of how um, Simon was changed to Peter. Examples to us of, of something significant, profound happening in their lives. And in the same way that it's important to us as individuals, it's not surprising then that God's name would be important to him. And so we're given that command that we're not to misuse the name of the Lord our God. His name is to be revered because as we proclaim his name, uh, we're really uh, conveying a reflection about who he is, his character, his personality, and so forth. And so when we misuse that name, whether we intend to do it or not, we end up maligning him, devaluing, dishonoring his reputation and his character. So it's important for us to, uh, to make sure that we understand the significance of honoring the name of the Lord. Now, as we think about names, um, we find that that uh, that was first revealed to us in terms of God's name back when Moses was still a shepherd. Remember, he had that period in his life for 40 years where he was a shepherd and he encounters the burning bush. And as a part of that conversation that, that he has there, God reveals his name for the first time to humanity. And it's, it's represented in, in our text. Um, 
you go back to the Hebrew with the word Yahweh, which simply means the, the self-existent one uh, who is self-determining and sovereign. Um, he's the one that is above all and in all and through all. But that's not the only name that he's known by. As we look through scripture, we see a variety of different names that, uh, that either others address him by or that he addresses himself by. And so we see the name of Jehovah, of Adonai, of El Shaddai, of Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, of Jehovah uh, Jireh. In fact, if you go through the list, you see that there's actually over 300 names that God is known by. And you may think, wow, why so many different names? Well, because he's a big God. Um, and that, there's just those, though, all of those different attributes and qualities and characteristics. And remember, names meant something in that day. And so if we, we try to give a name to each one of those qualities and characteristics, you just end up with a, a very long list. We also see that um, Jesus took this idea, this thought of the importance of name and carried it on in his own ministry in the New Testament. Uh, there comes a point where Jesus is having a conversation with some of the religious leaders in John 8. And the, the conversation goes as follows. Uh, Jesus uh, saying here, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, Jesus speaking. He saw it and was glad. Uh, the group that was there said, you're not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and, and you've seen Abraham, how can that be? Well, very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I am, that word that uh, described who God was, that name uh, that God had given to himself. And so it was a very telling indication of Jesus declaring that he was God. It was also um, a, a pretty dramatic step in, uh, in raising up people against him who, who thought that he was uh, taking steps inappropriate for, for just a, a normal human being uh, to be sane. And so we see the significance of, of the name is just uh, pervasive throughout uh, scripture. Now, let me pause as just a quick side note to say that when it says that we're not to misuse the name, it doesn't mean that we can't use the name. Uh, we can say God's name, um, and uh, with the exception of some Orthodox Jewish groups who, who refrain from use, using God's name, um, certainly Scripture conveys to us that it's fine to do that. It's all right to use the name of God. Where we fall into trouble is when we choose to misuse that name. And so let's look at the commandment in a little bit more detail and see exactly what it is that it tells us. It begins with the words, you shall not take. It's following in the footsteps of the first two commands where there's given a very, um, a very strong kind of negative declaration. You shall not. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not misuse uh, the name of the Lord. It's a, a very... A, very distinct, loud proclamation of the, the force and significance of that. And when we look to the word take here, it's a, it's a word that, can, that indicates an ongoing sense, which is good for us. Um, so it really is saying you shall not regularly or continuously take the name of the Lord in vain. Because sadly, the truth is that for many of us, at one point or another, we have misused God's name, especially in the context that we'll talk about this morning. So God says that, that we, we need to absolutely not fall into that habit, as so many have done, of misusing God's name on a regular basis. And so you shall not take what the name. Whose name? Well, uh, God's name, of course. Um, I remember again in, in the time of, of Moses that uh, knowing one's name um, was something unique because it gave them an insight into that person. You had an understanding that the average person wouldn't have. And so people actually would be a little hesitant uh, to share what their name was. For the people of God, knowing the name of God uh, gave them uh, the feeling of sort of a special privilege, which it was for them. God had revealed to them uh, something somewhat intimate about himself uh, to them. And as the one true covenant-keeping God, he'd given them this special privilege as a part of strengthening the relationship that he's building with them throughout this process. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God. And it's interesting here that, that even in this command, God uses two different names to him to describe himself. Uh, the word for Lord here is Yahweh. As we've talked about before, I am who I am, that name that comes out of that burning bush encounter. The second name, God, here is translated Elohim, which means 
mighty one and refers to the, the supreme and faithful uh, uh, attitude and qualities of God. And so when you bring these together, the Lord, uh, your God, you're really conveying this sense of, of one who is powerful and yet who grants to us the security that we can find in him alone. The psalmist captures that same sense in, uh, in um I'm sorry, the, Pro the writer of Proverbs captures that in Proverbs 18 with these words. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous man runs into it and is safe. We're to take, uh, we're not, uh, we shall not take the name of the Lord, our God, and then it ends up in vain. The word in vain here refers to uh, something that's empty of content or void of meaning. And so when we take God's name in vain, what we're often doing is treating it in a frivolous or a casual or, or a careless way. Oftentimes we don't mean to do that, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't still occur. And, and really, in essence, what we're saying is that God's name is, is of so little value to us that we just use it flippantly with any a thought or understanding. And what does God think about that? Well, we read in Leviticus 22 uh, some of his thoughts with these words. Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as holy. I, you know, as I think about the, the truths of God, one of the things I, I try to guard against is, is, is associating any of truths with a particular group of people because I think God's truths apply to everyone. But I would have to say as we talk about the name that one of the things that, that at least has popped in my mind is I wonder if, if as uh, men or as heads of household we understand the significance a little bit more, at least for generations past. I, I know in my family and I think of my dad and my, my grandfather, one of the things that was instilled in us was the importance of making sure that our name uh, was uh, one that remained honorable uh, within a community. Now, there's aspects of our life that we can't control. We can't control uh, the, the job that we're necessarily going to get or how much money we accumulate and so forth. But one of the things uh, that we did have a responsibility for as men was making sure uh, that, that honor was associated with our name. And I think that's that same idea of, of what we see with God here. He wants to make sure that when people say his name, it's, it's proclaimed, it's uttered, it's said with a manner of, of the honor and respect of which it deserves. Because if we don't, then we fall into to, to problems with that. And in fact, I think we fall into problems in, in three different ways. We can end up blaspheming God's name. We can end up using it in relationship to cursing and, and cussing. And then finally, uh, we can see it um, dishonored as we live lives of hypocrites. But let's unpack those a little bit more. We dishonor the name of God when we blaspheme, uh, when we blaspheme. Uh, to blaspheme is to speak with contempt or irreverence about God and his name and his character, his work and his attributes. Uh, we see that it often happens um, when, when we end up blaming for God, blaming God for things that he didn't necessarily do, uh, but we don't want to take the responsibility ourselves. Uh, one of my recent favorite verses that I've discovered here just in the last couple of years is a, a, a passage that we read in Proverbs 19.3 that says this, A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. And I love the passage because I see that demonstrated so often in our world today. Uh, people will make terrible choices, and sometimes they make terrible choices after terrible choices after terrible choices. And so their life is a train wreck, and yet who is it that they blame? Well, not themselves. They end up blaming God as a part of that. And, and in that action, they actually are blaspheming God. They're, they're actually using his name in vain. We also see that happen, this, this blasphemy of God, when we, we use it in a slang manner, again, kind of flippantly without much a thought or, or care. I don't think we intend to do this, but it just happens as a part of our life. And so uh, we, we end up, say, for example, um, a parent goes up, uh, say dad goes in and sees that his son is still in bed, and he says, good Lord, I can't believe that you're still sleeping. And he, he might go on and say, I swear to God, you sleep more than any person I know, Jesus Christ, when are you going to get up? And then uh, the bus comes and he says, oh my God, don't worry about it. You've already missed the bus. Each one of those phrases is a misuse of the name of God. Now, I don't think the father intended it to be used that way, but that's what ends up happening. 
it's, it's a malignment of, of God's name as we use it in that context. And again, this is something that while we might not take seriously, God does take seriously. So we read again in, in the book of Leviticus, the 24th chapter, Say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. And anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. Did God take this seriously? Yeah, he did. Now, uh, we're no longer under the law. This isn't a penalty that continues to be used today. But, but understand that it was a penalty that continued on long after Moses' time. In fact, <clears throat> doing my, my homework in all of this, I, I found that, uh, that there were still penalties for blasphemy up until the formation of our nation in the late 1600s when the 13 colonies were, were formed and moving toward eventually becoming these United States. There were laws on the books uh, that ranged from six months in prison to hanging for blasphemy in the name of God. It's really only in recent years that we've, we've taken God's name so casual as to use it in the ways that I just demonstrated. But that's not the only way um, that we can misuse the name of the Lord. We can also misuse it by cursing and cussing. We sometimes interchange those words, but they mean distinct things. When we talk about cursing, what we're really saying is we're calling a curse down upon someone. Now we often think of cursing as being something that happens in, in the demonic realm or with mummies or, or those kinds of things. But, uh, but cursing uh, takes place when we call on God to impose some form of adversity or misfortune on a person or a place or a thing. And what a dreadful habit that we find ourselves having fallen into, a, a dreadful act that we do, when we take the most sacred name in the world and, and use it to try to bring a, a curse, a condemnation about someone or, or, or something else. And so when we say things like, uh, damn you, or damn you to hell, or damn it to hell, I know that we don't really think about what we're saying there, but if we did, I hope we would cringe at that. Because what we're really calling on is for God to condemn them to a, a life uh, in, in the lake of fire for all of eternity, to, to live in an existence where they never know the presence of anything good. You know, like you, I've had people in, in my life that, uh, that are not my favorites. Now, I'm fortunate. I've, most people I get along well with, some of them I, I consider very good friends. But there's been a handful of individuals that, that we just have not connected. And yet the person that I dislike the most, the person that has, has maybe hurt me the most or caused the most damage to my life, even that person I would not want to see condemned to hell. I wouldn't want to see them damned. And yet we use that word so freely in our society uh, today. And it's not just uh, people that we curse, is it? We curse things. I mean, think about it. Um, when a man has a flat tire, uh, what does sometimes he say uh, toward that tire? He says, damn it. Or, or if a woman stumbles over a chair in the dark and, and she stubs her toe, what does she say? Similar kinds of words. What ends up happening is we use God's name as sort of an exclamation point on, on our statements of frustration rather than using it as a, as a, as a means of conveying um, uh, appreciation and gratitude of acknowledging the reverence of which it is due Again, folks, to, uh, to evoke eternal punishment on, on anyone or anything is just, a, is just a horrific idea if we really think about it, and yet we see it happen so many times. But it's not just cursing. We also see it happen with, with cussing. Cussing being uh, when we uh, take an obscene or profane word or phrase and use it in conjunction to someone who has been made in God's image. Now, that profanity, and I won't give you any examples of that. I can trust you know those. But um, I, it, even if we don't use the, the name of God in that, we're, we're directing it toward one that God is it's fearfully and wonderfully made. And so when we use those profanities, uh, we're really, again, dishonoring God in that process, which is why we see words like we do in Ephesians 4.29 that says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
Uh, we see uh, God's name being dishonored um, in, in a variety of ways. We, uh, we see it when we cuss. We see it uh, when we uh, use it in the terms of cursing. We also see it being dishonored when we live lives of a hypocrite. How does that play out? What do you mean by that? You know, as Christians, we take a label on. Uh, we, we take that name of, of being a Christ follower, of being Christ-like. That's what the name literally means. And whenever our actions or our words don't um, exemplify what it would be uh, to be Christ-like in that manner, then we're really dishonoring God by the things that we say or the things that we do. I, I love the words uh, of a, a writer by the name of, of Jen Wilkin who writes this. We can also misuse the name of the Lord by speaking holy words while living hollow lives. When we preach a moral code that we ourselves do not strive to uphold, we become just like those Jesus railed against in his ministry, the, the hypocrites, those he called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who honored God with their lips, but whose hearts were far from him. And we can end up falling into that same trap. We say one thing, but we live out something very different. Paul speaks, I think, fairly forcefully to this when we look to the book of Romans, the second chapter in verses 21 through 24, and he writes this. You then who teaches others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who whore and idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it's written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Wow, that's, that's pretty stark at the end there. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, none of us knows for sure what it is that God is going to say to us when we stand before him at the end time. Uh, my hope is, yours probably is as well, that we'll hear those words, good and faithful servant. But I'll tell you, the worst words I can imagine hearing would be words similar to that. That others ended up cursing God's, blaspheming God's, rejecting, dishonoring God's name because of you and the life that you lived. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here can occur if we're not cautious about that. That's why I think one of the biggest complaints against Christians today is, is, is that complaint of, of living lives of hypocrites. Now, I... I think sometimes that just comes out of a disagreement about um, lifestyles that people don't want to live that are more in accordance with God's will. But sometimes there's some legitimacy to that. We say one thing, but we end up living another. And so how do we ensure that doesn't happen in our lives? How do we avoid this, this tendency, this habit that's become so prevalent in our culture today? Well, I think we do it as we watch what we do, we watch what we say, and we watch what we think. And let's look at those individually. We watch what we do. We live lives that honor God, that honor God. The things that we do uh, lift him, exalt him. Uh, Paul writes about it in this way in Colossians 3.17. And he says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Just as God can be um, I condemn because of, of things that we, we do that are, are certainly not honoring to him that, that society sees and says they don't want to have any part of. God can also be exalted when we do good things in his name, when we lift him up as, as we act in a, in a manner that, um, that, that conveys our love for our God. Now, that's, of course, always easy to do when life's going well, but what about when circumstances are tough? What about those situations? Well, uh, we see that Peter addresses that in 1 Peter 4 when he says, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So whether good times are bad, we're supposed to live our lives in a manner that lifts up God, lifts up his name, that exalts who he is. But it's not just the things that we do, it's the things that we say as well. And so we should say things that honor God. We know that we honor God when we uh, share the gospel with others. We know that we honor God when we sp share spiritual truths, whether those are moral truths or spiritual truths or eth ethical truths. But we also honor God 
when we speak hope and encouragement to others, especially in a world where increasingly we, uh, we see despair and discouragement becoming more and more uh, the attitude that, that exists out there. Again, we read in the words of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5 this truth. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. That's part of what we're called to do as Christians. That's part of the way that we, we exalt the name of the Lord is by being an encouragement uh, to others of, of trying to build them up rather than falling in the, the footsteps of the world which so often tries to tear people down. And these two things, the, the things that we say and the things that we do, well, they sort of follow in footstep with the things that we think because almost always what we say and do is a byproduct of what it is that we think. And so we need to think thoughts that honor God. As Paul writes in Colossians 3, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And what are those things above? Well, Paul helps us out with that in Philippians 4, 8. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Are those the things that you think about in your day? I don't know that it's the things that the world points us toward. As you read the news feeds or as you watch the news broadcast or even if you hear conversations of folks walking down the street. I'm not sure it's the good things, the positive things, the encouraging things that we focus on. Too often it's the discouraging, those things that convey uh, bitterness and anger and hostility and hatred. And if that's what we fill our minds with, and that's uh, kind of the life we're going to live, that's what's going to influence what we say and what we do, and, and all of that can end up being dishonoring to God. But if we go with Paul's list, those things that are true and noble, right and pure, lovely, admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. If that's what fills our thoughts and our minds, then we end up living those out. Then we end up making those a part of our conversations. And then we end up honoring the name of the Lord, our God. And so my hope is that as we uh, move beyond this uh, third command, that you'll leave with a little bit better perspective of what it uh, is calling us to do, that, that we can fall into um, taking the names Lord in vain uh, too often if we're not careful. Again, I would say it's really the way of the world. But God has called us to be different. God has called us to be a people that exalt the one true God, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And so may we do that by the things that we think, through the things that we say, and through the actions that we undertake. And may that be true this day and every day. Amen. Today we've talked about the importance of um, honoring God's name, of not taking it in vain, of uh, bestowing upon it the respect that it's due. But as we think about the various ways that we, we honor God, we know that it's not just limited to the use of his name. One of the ways in which we honor God is in what we're about to participate in now, and that's the celebration of the Lord's table. Because as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, we really do bestow upon him honor and respect and gratitude. Realizing that what he did, he did not have to do. He chose to do. And not because of any benefit that he received, not because of any accolades that he would receive or, or any acknowledgement from the world. But instead he did it out of love for us. Despite the ridicule that he would face, despite the punishment that he would endure. And so may we give thanks as we partake of these elements. The elements, of course, um, are ones that I suspect you're familiar with. Uh, the bread that reminds us of the broken body of Christ. That body that was pierced, that was spit upon, that was had the, the spear thrust into, that was um, flogged, uh, that was just abused in so many different ways. And yet a body that was broken for us. We also think of the cup. The cup representing the blood that was shed by Jesus, the blood that flowed from the wounds on his back, his head, his hands, his feet, his side. 
a blood that would serve to, to cover our iniquities that we might uh, at the appropriate time uh, be able to stand before God as righteous ones, not based on our merit, but based on the sacrifice of Christ. And so as we uh, take of these elements today, um, may we again honor God as a part of that. May we give thanks to him for what he alone was able to do for us, probably for what he alone would be willing to do for us. Give his all that we might have eternal life. As we prepare for the elements, I'm going to ask you if you would to bow with me as we pray God's blessing over this time together. Let's pray. Almighty Father, how we thank you for this time and this moment in which we do reflect and recall the sacrifice of your Son. Father, help us never to take that for granted. Help us uh, uh, to not treat that flippantly or, or offhandedly as we've talked about with your name. To just presume, Lord, that it's there, but, but to always be mindful of what was endured, that we might have life and have life eternal. Bless this time, God. We pray that if there's uh, things that um, are distancing us at this moment from you, maybe things that we have done or said that are inappropriate, God, forgive us of those and help us, God, to avoid those in the future. And Lord, if there's uh, things that we didn't say that we should have, opportunities that you opened and that we walked by, forgive us of that as well. And give us a boldness, Lord, to be stronger, to take uh, full advantage of of those opportunities in the days and the months ahead. Thank you for this time together, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we think about that Last Supper, we're reminded of that meal where Jesus gathered with his disciples. As a part of that meal, he took a loaf of bread, broke it, and he gave thanks. And he said to them then and to us these words, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. And in the same way, we're told that Jesus at the end of that meal took a cup. When he'd given thanks, he said to them then and to us these words, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Amen. In the light of your presence when nothing is hid I worship you just as I am Every motive, ambition, thought and emotion Is revealed by the touch of your hand By the power of your Spirit, open my eyes, Lord. Let the depths of my heart be exposed. Lord, in vain I've persisted to be self-sufficient. Jesus, teach me dependence on you.
Okay, well, has our prayer been answered? Have you sensed God's presence here? Have you experienced him through the, the songs that have been played? Have you, you sensed him in the prayers that have been offered it up? Have you sensed him uh, through the study of his word? I hope so. I pray that that is the case. Folks, we thank you for being a part of the service, whether it was just the regular part or the celebration of the, the Lord's table. All of this um, is intended to exalt him, to honor his name, because surely he is deserving of that. Hope you have a great week. I hope you truly enjoy on this last big holiday of the summer season. I also hope we see you next week. So um, join with me and we'll wrap up our time together here in a final word of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty Father, how we thank you for this time and for this day. God, help us to um, take all that we've experienced here in the last few minutes. And may this uh, serve not only as an encouragement, sort of a, a spiritual booster shot for us, for what awaits us this coming week, but may it also prompt us, God, to be more mindful of the lives that we live and, and the way that we interact with others. Even in the words that we say, God, too often, um, we can inadvertently um, use your name in vain and help us to avoid that. Help us instead through uh, the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we think, to glorify your name, to build up your name, to exalt your name. For it is a name uh, far above all others, Lord. Thank you again for this time. Watch over us until we come together again. And we pray all of these in the wondrous name of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.